Dobar večer. Um, and I switched to English immediately because it's, uh, um, it's part of an international project and we have uh, uh, guests who are not only um, able to speak in, in, in and deliver talks in various languages, but also for various audiences. And in this case, uh, the context is the Western Balkans project of Manifesto 14, to which ICA Sofia is contributing a parallel event and a cycle of expert talks. The parallel event was an exhibition titled Self-Splaining, A Triumph of Empathy, and it took place in Kosovo, in Pristina, uh, in the space of the Faculty for Fine Arts of the uh, Pristina University. Uh, and it ended on, uh, uh, at the end of October. Uh, we were very happy to, to have that uh, in Pristina. And the expert talks uh, is the, a part of the parallel program we are doing in Sofia. It started in, in June with the lecture uh, of Kati Katerina Filiuk, uh, a Ukrainian-born curator now based in Italy. Uh, and she just opened an exhibition in, the, in Berlin um, with Ukrainian artists and, and uh, historical contemporary. Uh, and her talk was dedicated to the Isolatia project in the city of Solidar in Ukraine, which is now on the borderline, um, you know, the, the front line. Uh, during this um, um, in, in the intensive and m monstrous uh, conflict and war. Uh, the expert talks, uh, the stage two, uh, is happening now. Uh, under different circum circumstances, the war we're hoping uh, to end soon is actually raging and there is no clear end in sight. Uh, the art world, the, the practices of artists and, and, and curators and all of us is, is going on and will probably survive, um, unlike people who are in the middle of this conflict. But anyhow, the stage two of, of uh, our expert talks uh, will happen in the next few days, starting with presentation of Snežana Krstiva, a Bulgarian-born curator who has international career ranging from uh, Beijing, where he, she, she got her education, to London, to Moscow, to international engagements uh, now and in the future. Uh, tomorrow, we'll have a talk by Inke Arns, who is uh, already here a curator of, uh, of, an, of an art institution in, in Dortmund, which I could never remember. It was like HMV, HMKV. Uh, she also, <laughs> sorry? Uh, yes, because one of the top places for, uh, for media art in, in Germany and not only, uh, a curator whom I personally have known for more than 25 years, who is, uh, who is uh, who, who's gonna talk tomorrow in this same space. Uh, she's currently the, um, uh, she just finished her engagement with curating the Kosovo National Pavilion at uh, the last Venice Biennial. And then probably next week we will have two online um, presentations, lecture, lectures by Sonia Lau Abraham, uh, an expert in art and the legal system currently based in Istanbul, uh, who has opened recently uh, an exhibition in, in Berlin in Bet Kunstlerhaus Bethanien. Uh, which is called uh, Guilty, Guilty, Guilty. And, it, and she's expert in, you know, like feminism and, and, and art and, and, the crimi uh, and the legal system of, of a society that, that refers to art. And then we will have an online presentation by Elma Hodzic, who is a, a curator at the Museum of <coughs> History in uh, Sarajevo, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And she will tell us uh, about um, <coughs> the way a narrative, a narrative following a very dramatic conflict between humans in ex Yugoslavia in this case, how, this, how such a conflict is, uh, is narrated through museum display and art projects. So now without um, um, going any, any, any further, I'll just give the, the word to Snežana Krstova and I'm dying to find out what she will be talking about because she just left uh, a country and a city where she was uh, making a career and a very successful, very vis visible curatorial institutional practice. And it was cut short by forces which are beyond our control. My talk is going to be, I will make it quite short and I hope we can open it to, I don't know, some questions uh, and discussion. Uh, if we can, I wanted to, um, it will be a lot about pain. Uh, guilt is implied. Um, so empathy, I hope. Uh, um, yeah, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the challenges of institutional curating versus uh, 
more heads-on curatorial activism because I teach uh, in curatorial practice master degree program and one of my let's say courses uh, is uh, curatorial activism and I struggle 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 and I still do struggle about how curatorial activism in terms of institutional practice can um, you know can be defined or uh, how we can uh, expand it um, yeah so my, I have some ideas I will share with you but um, yeah this is kind of um, I hope it's interesting but it's a very personal story um, you will see some you know my personal archives of uh, images uh, but also no, no, not all uh, some uh, some are taken from the website of Garage Museum uh, but um, it's a uh, yeah so it's a very personal narrative it's a little bit of a let's say retrospective so bear with me i hope it's interesting and you can find something to relate otherwise you know i'll make it short so you don't have to you know feel very painful i'll start with uh, this weird uh, thing that happened to me so on the 23rd of february uh, just day before uh, the russian forces walked on Kiev. Um, I posted with a friend of mine who is the chief curator of uh, this art center in Murmansk uh, region in the very far north, um, Olga, uh, Olga Shirkastup. Uh, she's working for this uh, center called Radiance, who is like actually sponsored by Malakhov, Andrei Malakhov, uh, who is a kind of a pop pop person in uh, in Russian scene um, and uh, we are very good friends with her we live uh, next door uh, a little bit outside of Moscow um, so we were talking about this uh, mm, sort of we were preparing a couple of exhibitions in garage uh, and uh, I hear from many colleagues that they started having problems with loans, with uh, people who pulled out of exhibitions. Uh, and this was before, uh, before you know, the, this, this really, um, you know, rock rockets started to kind of uh, fly over the border. Um, so we, we, we felt like we need to speak out, so we posted this image on, on Instagram. You know, I have a very modest Instagram, not many followers, uh, but suddenly this image caught uh, somehow the attention of, uh, of everyone. It was reposted, it was uh, in the media, you know? So I, like cultural practitioners speaking out for cultural. So what we were trying to say is that cultural boycott. So no war, but there was no war yet. So just a few hours later, I wake up uh, and I receive angry. I see in the post, on the post, uh, in the Instagram, extremely furious messages uh, bordering on hatred of like, how could you think about culture in a moment where, you know, Russia has done, has invaded Ukraine. And this is, I wake up and it's like, a, it's a matter of a few hours. Uh, so of course I take down, um, you know, they are, there was also posts like, so okay, uh, what is Garage going to say? What is the position of the institution? So in a few hours, well, obviously we had to have the answer for everything. So blank, black, this is the color that for many uh, cultural practitioners in Russia kind of became the main color for some, for some time now. Uh, and then I posted on 26th of um, uh, February a statement that we all took collectively with my colleagues at Garage, uh, a decision that we are going to cancel all the exhibitions that are uh, being prepared and we are not going to do any exhibitions until the war is not over, which we didn't, never, never thought that it will last so long. Maybe it was stupid, uh, maybe it was uh, short-sighted, maybe we would should have been alarmed already in 2014 when Crimea was annexed and where, you know, it should have rung a very, very loud bell, but we didn't. Uh, and Garage was uh, always for me a oasis of freedom uh, because we are a private institution, we're a publicly minded private museum. We were, I, I 
will continue for a while to speak we. Uh, uh, I have to drop it at some point, but uh, it's been part of my, you know, uh, decade of my life almost. So, um, so yeah, it was, uh, we took this uh, collectively and we knew that we are probably saying goodbye to uh, of our career, of, uh, you know, everything. You know, probably, that uh, it's not allowed to use the word war in uh, Russia now. You can get, like, um, in jail. You can get uh, first administrative, then go to jail. They shorten the process. Uh, it's really like that. Um, we did use it. Uh, it was a bit more convoluted, but I think the message is quite clear. So, basically, we realize that you cannot pretend and you cannot go on with the normality when, when uh, you know, people are killed. Um, and um, yeah, so this was the meeting we had with our, this is very small part of the staff at Garage, but this is, uh, this is the only, like maybe first meeting, or a kind of emergency meeting we had after the war started. And our, I didn't, I didn't film, I uh, didn't take a picture, but our director was uh, right there and he convened this meeting. And it's the first time that actually he cried. Uh, and um, he said something like, you know, I can't guarantee you that you, we will be fine. Uh, I can't guarantee you we'll have a, you know, anything. <laughs> not in terms of, um, not support from Garage, because they did support, they paid a salary until the very last, and they still pay salaries to many other people. Uh, but in terms of, you know, your future, your, you know, your life, as you know it. Uh, he cried. He, I've never seen him cry. Uh, so, yeah, that was a very uh, shocking moment. You all kind of working for an institution, you always think that they have your back. Uh, especially working for a private institution sponsored by Roman Abramovich, uh, who was, you know, taking part of the negotiations, and and I have to be, I have to say, I was very proud that he did that. Um, so uh, in a way, like you, yeah, you do, you do feel that if a person like in that position actually is threatened and he, you know, is breaking down in front of you, probably things are pretty shit. Um, <laughs> So this is what Garage is now. Uh, Garage is occupying uh, all former restaurant building, which was built in 1968, very uh, kind of symbolic here. Um, and uh, so we, you know, Rem Cool House renovated to become a museum where we have exhibitions. Uh, but now, now, half of the building is occupied by uh, our library. Our library was, uh, to, to tell you, was a very, very small space next to that building in an educational center in the same park, Gorky Park. Uh, so, but we had much more, uh, many more books than we actually could, you know, exhibit, uh, show or uh, in, that, in that small building. So, this is, was the opportunity to show everything we have, and like uh, you know, um, I had a big collection of books that uh, I donated to the library as well before I left. Uh, and, so, and it's full, and it works, and it's full of people, uh, full of students, and I have to say, it pains me to say it, but it's better suited for a library and a research center than it was for exhibitions. In a way, because it's a restaurant building, it was anyway very hard to make exhibitions there. Always trouble. Remco House made the network out of it, uh, but uh, he did not make it easy for curators. <laughs> and, and, and that's good. That's also good, you know, uh, a good challenge for us. Um, and um, so <laughs> this uh, is the building that we were planning to open next, uh, which is like right in front of the main building that you saw just now at the libraries. Uh, it's ruins. It's uh, called now, we have named it the hexagon. It was a hexagon. In, it was built in the 1920s. Uh, it was um, many things. It was an exhibition hall for, uh, for cars. It was then a disco. It was then a, uh, with many things. And then it, was, it burned at some point. Uh, and it remained as a ruin for many, many years until Roman Abramovich kind of brought it, bought it. 
and, uh, and then we wanted to make it our next home. And we had invited Japanese architects uh, to Sana uh, Bureau. You know, we had a presentation, we had a press conference, -na -na, all the plans. It, would, um, it was supposed to look, uh, yeah, okay, I'm jumping a little bit. But uh, what I'm saying is that this is the last exhibition I did, uh, which was called Spirit Labor, Duration, Difficulty and Effect. And it was about durational practices, you know, uh, with uh, more than 50 artists talking about how you can use time and uh, this special future, which is duration, duration, to talk about, you know, um, kind of recoup for contemporary art that it can be difficult uh, and it's okay to be difficult. But I wanted to recoup that uh, effect uh, um, again, uh, especially talking about performance, especially talking about a show that is about performative art, but then there is not much life, because uh, it was right uh, after COVID, so it was still very difficult to, because we originally we planned half of the show to be live performances, you know, durational live performances and for like six months. But we, yeah, we couldn't do that. But uh, so it was very, very ironic that this, this banner that we usually, you know, change for exhibition just stayed and it's still there. So it's like this during, yeah, maybe it's just funny for, not funny, like, yeah. So this was, uh, I was uh, planning a show with Maurizio Catalan at that time, uh, and he had the luck or unluck, I don't know, to come exactly the day after uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. You know, so it invaded on Thursday, 24th of February was a Thursday. He came on Saturday. And he stayed the whole week because he, his flight got canceled. So he, he stayed and watched all the process of degradation, you know, human, emotional, all of it that went, you know, we just like, kept on like crying, I crushed my car, he was there, you know, like, it was, and he was there, he was like bringing apples, he was saying, you know, you have a very nice color, it matches your, I don't know, your, <laughs> keep, it's, it's very, it was very far from him, so he, it kept, he kept us alive in a way, he kind of, at some point, he ordered flowers for all the team because we were like crying all the time. You know, big plans, and you are like in the middle of it, and you are, it's surreal when you walk uh, on, on Sunday, you go with Maurizio, and you're like, okay, yeah, we put this work here, we do this, we change that. <sighs> surreal. So this on the right hand side is uh, also uh, curator Lars Park Larsen, who we actually invited to work with us and he came like a few, one month before that. He was about to come and work with us. I was so excited. Uh, and he's a, great, he's a great curator. Yeah, this was what su was supposed to be. Uh, it's like the six pavilions. Uh, three of them were supposed to be dedicated to exhibitions. One like entirely about library, archives. Uh, obviously one about cafe and uh, uh, and then there was this like round exhibition hall that was uh, supposed to be underground. Um, yeah, storage room. Uh, and, yeah, and and also what you see here is nothing. It's a it's a former garage for really garage uh, for uh, taxi drivers and uh, and uh, it's a bit uh, outside of Moscow. And uh, it's about like, I don't know, 4,000 square meters of spaces that they gave us, um, Roman, uh, who gave it to Garage. Uh, and we were supposed to open a huge residency program uh, that was to be dedicated to sustainable, ecological kind of thematics. And we were developing a super interesting uh, program around it uh, that's also gone. We were, um, okay, this is a bit too far. We were also, it's not in the slides, but we were uh, in the same park. We were about to open a 5,000 square meters of institution that was going to be dedicated entirely on performance art, on like life art. So that's also a big pain in uh, knowing that this could can't happen. You, we have worked so hard to make this city very cosmopolitan, and it was about to get very cosmopolitan. You know, people wanted to work there. People came there. There was, uh, you know, VAC opened just uh, uh, a year ago. Yeah, anyway. Uh, so my little journey through Garage, uh, and I, uh, just to, I'm trying to kind of make, uh, 
trying to kind of uh, make a summary of strategies, let's say, as, as I used uh, as a curator, that could or could not be called activist, I don't know, but... Uh, so the first thing I did when I started at Garage is I organized uh, a conference uh, because Garage has very much to do with performance uh, art. It had a huge archive of performance art. It also it made Roma, uh, Marina Abramovic a uh, huge exhibition. Uh, so we kind of felt we are connected to performance. So we uh, started with this uh, conference, which is called uh, Performance Art Ethics in Action. It was uh, the entire exhibition at that moment. It was a temporary pavilion built by Shigeru Ban in the Gorky Park. Uh, it was like, uh, you know, a huge conference for 300 people. Not so many came. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I curated this, this performance and this is, it really stayed with me, you know, this ethics thing. Uh, this is Simon Crinchley who wrote a book about, uh, you know, ethics in action. It's a very interesting because he tried to relate it to art. Uh, and it, uh, um, you know, it really relates to nihilism and kind of positivism and how you can get out of this uh, stupid duality. Uh, and I think it has a, a lot of um, potential, let's say, for, um, for, for you as a, as a practitioner. Uh, then, uh, you know, Lechizar knows and some other... Uh, one of my curatorial uh, strategies, because I'm from Bulgaria, and I think um, one of the reasons also Kate uh, decided that we will have a, a, a strong direction towards Eastern Europe, because we share you know, a communal kind of social past. Uh, and we, uh, it is obvious that uh, you cannot use and copy-paste Anglo-Saxon models of institutions. So she, uh, you know, we decided that under her kind of, uh, you know, motivation that we will look at institutions that are around us, now, now neighbors, and that did very well. And one of them was uh, Moderna Galleria in Slovenia. And uh, what they did with their collection and how they managed the communities is amazing. It's still my inspiration. And Denka Badovina is still, you know, uh, someone that I, um, I reread her text and I uh, talk to her and I look for advice to her. And Kate did this amazing thing where she said, okay, we are a museum, we don't have a collection. We still don't have a collection, but we have an archive. So uh, archive can also be a collection. You know, who said that collection can only be a traditional, you know, sculptures and paintings. So we made our archive our collection. We declared ourselves, we changed all the kind of legal, we became a museum. And by doing so, we, we thought, okay, maybe we don't have a collection, but that doesn't prevent us to look at how collections are made and how they can be Polit political tools, uh, not just merely, you know, showing, uh, showcasing um, some history shaping pieces. Um, so, uh, yeah, so of course, the f you know, we did some exhibitions before that about private collections in Russia, private collections in Russia are extremely, uh, how to say, closed. You can't get access to them. So opening up these private collections was also a big step. Not many people appreciated it, but uh, it was a big step. So the next thing we did is that we invited Zdenka and I co-curated this exhibition uh, to use the um, Art is uh, 2000 plus uh, collection uh, that Zdenka built uh, since the 2000s um, to, uh, yeah, to exhibit it in, in, in Russia, which is the first kind of uh, such a, on a big scale um, Russian, uh, oh, sorry, Eastern Europe, um, artists were showing in Russia. They, they obviously had exhibitions before that, uh, but not on such a scale. Plus, we, uh, she uh, collected works, especially uh, through this exhibition of Russian artists, which was great. Uh, and and we, uh, in each of my exhibitions, I try to show uh, Bulgarian artists. Uh, this is my little contribution to uh, you know, the cultural scene. Um, but uh, yeah, I think Kate was motivated by the fact that we, you know, I was also Bulgarian and uh, she also was interested to know like what kind of uh, institutions are doing well, uh, what kind of models we can look at and instead of looking all the time at, uh, you know, North America or uh, England. Um, we had this like five lessons, which were lessons about self-organizations, lessons about 
um, language lessons, uh, you know, it, it, they were poetically called, uh, but uh, they were very to the point. Uh, and you can get a sense of, uh, of uh, how activist artists were, actually, in the, in the uh, context of absolute lack of institutions. They were creating institutions, they were becoming institutions. Instead of waiting for uh, for funding for uh, you know somebody to create these institutions, uh, yeah, and it was a big lesson uh, how really you know how you can use your body as well politically, uh, how performance arts can be uh, really a statement, um, but mainly mainly how collections can be used. This is the lessons I got from there. Then well, I'm not going to talk about all my uh, projects. Usually, I find curators talk quite boring when they talk about their own projects. So, <laughs> so I'm going to try, but to, to just highlight what I take, I have taken personally from all these projects. Um, so another uh, project that I've co-curated with uh, most of my actually projects are co-curated, and this I found amazing. Uh, I don't actually like to work alone. I found it very interesting to work with someone, to have a co-thinker, and uh, yeah, um, yeah. So this uh, was a project initiated actually by three curators, one in Poland, two in North America, uh, and Dieter Rohrstrate um, was, uh, uh, was one of the curators. His wife uh, uh, was one of the co-curators, and um, what was that? And the other one? Shit, I forgot. Um, yeah. So the uh, the first actually uh, it, 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 there was a uh, the, the attempt was to make a connection between kinetic art that was developing in Eastern Europe and what was developing in Latin America, and they actually not only the movement that is in the work, but the movement of people as well that happened in those in that historical period. Because, because of the war, there's actually a lot of Eastern, uh, artists from Eastern Europe that actually moved to Latin America. And there's also a lot of Latin American artists that moved to France, most of it that did op art and yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, so we tried to trace, that was apparently, you know, in this huge book that is uh, art history since the 1900s, uh, Rosalind Krauss and Hal Foster. There is actually only one page about kinetic art and op art. That's it. Uh, so we were like, mm, okay, this is not enough. There is like a lot of stuff that went, and it was actually very politically motivated uh, thing, you know, because it's uh, sometimes op art is uh, very much related to very decorative and kind of uh, visually flat thing, conceptual. Uh, but uh, for artists from Eastern Europe and Latin America, it meant much more. It was about really politicizing the eye, because the eye is the main kind of sensor through which we uh, see the world. So uh, my uh, contribution to this, because uh, in Garage, we somehow, we never take exhibitions that we don't transform a little bit. So we add uh, something that it grounds them in the local context, or um, so we, we kind of try to motivate them why they are there, uh, and what connects them to here and now and to the, to the scene. Uh, and to the history. And also one thing I am very proud of is that, you know, when I went to uh, Warsaw to see the first iteration, uh, I saw a very sterile, uh, castrated exhibition about work that is about movement, is about um, interaction, is about really going out there in the in the real world, no, in the in the this in the uh, I don't know the factories in the people's life in uh, and it was very you know it was very pristine gallery white cube mm, and it, I was mm, it was dead it was dead to me so I uh, I uh, for garage I, um, I really really uh, spent a lot of time to think how can I make it can, how can I revive this energy. And uh, it's for you to judge, but one thing I did is like, I noticed <laughs> that most of the artists uh, are actually alive. And you can actually talk to them. You can still talk to them. And you can still ask them for stuff, you know? So I, I went to Julio Le Park or uh, Carlos Cruz Diaz, and I was like, can we reconstruct something? You know, there is this thing that you did in 1961. Uh, I really like it. This is a piece that he did for an airport. 
uh, in Buenos Aires, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I'm like, why don't, can we reconstruct it? And he, uh, he said yes. Even, he even said yes. He's like, usually I will take $50,000 fees, but not here. Uh, I am, you know, I'm really excited. Julio Le Park, uh, amazing piece he did in Labyrinth in Paris sometime in the 60s as well. And people, how can you understand about the, the power that they were talking about, uh, what visual effect can create in your mind, the dazzling effect that Julio Le Park was talking, no? When that, this moment, even for seconds, when you don't know where you are, when your world is fragmented, when you don't know where is the ceiling, where is the, where is the wall, where are you, this particular seconds of moments is what makes you mobilized and ready for changes. And so I wanted people to have this dazzling effect. So what I did is that uh, usually get into the exhibition through these two staircases in the, in the building. So I blocked the entrance completely with this labyrinth. So you have no choice, no democracy, I says. Uh, let's just, uh, <laughs> no choice, you just walk into this installation. Uh, obviously, there was a sign. If you, you know, have a, you, there is an elevator, you have another entrance. Uh, but uh, and it worked. You know, there were like these uh, mirrors inside, and uh, it worked because for a few seconds you really don't know. You like you lose completely um, understanding of space. And uh, what we also did is uh, I found. This exhibition by group Dvizhenie, by group uh, movement in Russia, uh, in Soviet Russia, that did this amazing exhibition in 1965 in St. Petersburg. And uh, it, um, I, we only had a little small plan in a catalog, which was, the si was this size. And uh, Sasha Obuchov was co-curator with me, because Sasha is the brain of Garage. You know, all the, the old archive belongs to her, basically. Uh, and uh, so I was like, Sasha, do you know anything about this? He's like, not, not sure. Let's call, let's call them. So we start calling them and they start like investing. We were like real detectives. So we start investigating and we found out that uh, so, uh, like uh, finally they manipulated the final, actually some works were not there that were in the plan. Uh, there were photographs, but actually there were no real works there. So the, they were added later. You know, there, uh, there was one artist that was the founder of Vizhenia Group and um, they had many fights in between, which is why it kind of, uh, it, uh, uh, many things that uh, have been done in, uh, in Russia, in Soviet Russia, and by, uh, they didn't have where to store them. They didn't, you know, they didn't see the point to kind of, uh, keep them so they were destroyed. Many things were destroyed. Nothing is archived, uh, really. Uh, another thing um, I'm very proud of, uh, and it was a separate commission, but uh, is connected to the kinetic work, because this is uh, uh, Vyacheslav Kolychuk, who is uh, one of the most famous, let's say, kinetic artists from, uh, it was not, he was not related to any of the groups and collectives or movements. Uh, he put this huge atom, it was called atom, it was a musical, uh, architectural musical composition that he uh, authored himself. So this was completely his idea of how to connect this thing, he, this ball that is like, it's self-suspended, <clears throat> not levitating, but it's suspended on, uh, you know, maybe you'll see it if it works on YouTube. Yep, 67, sorry. There is a very emotional sound, but... Uh... So this is his daughter. This is a, a major piece of work that was destroyed. It was hell. It was uh, built with the Korchatov Institute, uh, which is the you know they have they had. Uh, 
uh, Vyacheslav was saying that he, they had uh, a lot of technological things that he needed to build it. They held, they held it for a few months and they took it down. Uh, and it, it is a piece of engineering, like genius. Uh, and it has been shown just for a few months. And so I really, I, uh, we made a lot of effort and we reconstructed it, believe it or not, from one photograph. It had no plans, no architectural sketches, nothing, nothing. Just one daughter that was alive and he was barely, he was uh, unfortunately ill of cancer. So he passed away just one month before the opening and he couldn't see it like resuscitate. Uh, so he was also not very helpful uh, at some moment. So the architect was also like 90 years old, you know, he was not in his mind. Uh, so we had to uh, rebuild it with the help of the daughter, who was at the beginning very, you know, skeptical and reluctant. So I also had to kind of convince her that this is uh, just strange. But yeah, one one photograph, black and white photograph, and it's still there. We have it. Uh, we have it. But uh, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a challenge. Another project I'm gonna skip. With, um, running over time. Uh, so yeah, I'm very proud of is uh, the coming world. Uh, Ecology as the new politics. It was, it was a show that took the entire museum. This is garage. Uh, and uh, it was dedicated to ecology. Uh, but we wanted to look at ecology as uh, not really as, uh, how to say, as this uh, didactical thing that, you know, you should recycle this, you should do this, otherwise, you know, or catastrophe. We also didn't want to talk uh, this narrative, of apocalyptic narrative, you know, to continue. So actually, you know, as a curator, from time to time, you lose faith in art. Uh, not exactly in art, but you lose faith in how much art can change, actually, things. But also from time to time, you regain this faith because uh, you understand that um, art do has do have the power, do has the does have the power to. Uh, to change things, and especially when we're talking about things like ecology, the things that, you know, when you visualize them, it's already too late. Uh, and for me, art is contemporary art, especially uh, is, you know, a mini model uh, where you can test reality. So uh, especially talking about this kind of uh, topics, uh, reality, uh, art seems to have uh, extreme power. Um, so yeah. Uh, Doug Atkin had this beautiful installation made some uh, years ago, and we convinced him to reinstall it in uh, in um, in garage. And this was really uh, very much to do with emotions as well, uh, that you are kind of surrounded by this uh, uh, very beautiful garden, uh, but inside of it there is this sterile room where you walk in, you are completely dressed in like white in white clothes, almost like a scientist, and you're given a, a bat, a baseball bat, and you can do whatever you want with the, with the furniture. So it was interesting to observe what people do in this space. They had like 15 minutes or 20 minutes, you know, that they can do whatever they want. Most people smash it. And it was also a thing, a thing that you, this release of energy, and usually this is, nature is connected to this uh, emotion, you know, this romantic motion that, you go to nature so you can release some, uh, you know, some negative energy, I don't know, some tiresome feeling. Uh, amazing six-channel film that we, uh, we were the last in the fi five institutions that sort of co-produced it uh, and co-toured it. It's called purple, and purple is the color actually of fear, apparently in, uh, yeah. And uh, it was an extremely beautiful collage of archival found footage and uh, newly kind of shot scenes. Um, by, exactly, and I blanked. Uh, John the Conference, yeah, oh my God. Uh, yeah, John the Conference. Uh, <laughs> no, it's a bit embarrassing not to say that. Uh, so yeah, uh, the, the, this is also something I'm, I'm extremely proud of because this took a lot of negotiations. And uh, I, at the beginning when I saw this film, I was uh, not so convinced about it. 
and it took me some time to uh, to convince myself that is uh, it's not just uh, very beautiful because it's very sensory experience. You know, the floor is uh, is purple. Everything is purple. You walk in, it's a completely sound isolated. There is an extremely sensitive sound uh, in in this. They all move uh, and they change, and you have to follow them. And oof, it's a uh, it's an experience. But at the same time, you know, the images that you see and the sequence, you know, at the beginning I thought it's, it's, it's too simple, uh, you get it, like, but, uh, but it's something that you, uh, yeah, you kind of, uh, you have to experience it, maybe look at it many times uh, as, as, uh, as everything. Another thing that I'm very proud of and I'm gonna end on this uh, is uh, Laura Constantia's uh, commission that was a separate thing, but it's also related to this, uh, to this, um, a exhibition uh, and they wh what they did is this it says you know it's a very minimal in a way intrusion uh, they uh, what you see is uh, maybe you wouldn't even pay attention to it's like you have trees you have some flowers that have like fallen down you're like okay that's normal you know but then you realize and if you're a Moscovite uh, and you realize that these trees don't produce flowers they don't, uh, <laughs> so then you start questioning yourself, then you walk a little bit closer and you see, you see them there in the different stages of, uh, of uh, degradation. Uh, you see them, you, maybe you can touch them, beginning you can touch them, then we put some fences because they were you know, doing uh, crazy stuff with them. Uh, you, can, you see them there from plastic. So what they did is that they made replicas of uh, seven different stages of degrading of Robles Marios. It's a tree that is in the Caribbean, uh, is a common, super common tree in the Caribbean region, because they themselves are based in Puerto Rico. And uh, what they have experienced over the, over the years is this huge flooding that happened because the trees were cut and, uh, uh, and also because of the colonization of the land and the land was used for you know, reasons that the, it shouldn't be used. Uh, and uh, they imagined the future where actually this tree will grow in Moscow. So it was a very soft way to kind of, you know, some visualize some, some scenarios that could develop uh, over the years. Uh, but my greatest curatorial activism, and I have to say, and I still struggle to call my institutional creating as activism, is uh, education. Uh, I started teaching and this is where I realized that um, we have a program, master program in curating at Garage, which is you know, quite unique because it's a museum that started it together with the university. Uh, and uh, we have developed this kind of theater, sort of like what they do in theater. You, you know, they ha you have this master who kind of leads you throughout two years. So we decided to do the same in curating. So you have like me or my colleague, and we had students throughout like two years and I had a very different approach from her because she teach, she teach more chronologically. For me, curating is not related to chronological at all. It's uh, actually very anachronistic. So I started from the 90s because we are still kind of in globalization, you know, uh, maybe now it's the end, maybe not. Uh, but um, so I, I thought that, you know, they should understand where the time they live in and then understand what was the past. So. Uh, I started in the 90s and all the turns, like social turns, educational turns, performative turn, uh, I don't know, anthropological turn. And instead of like talking about the canon, I talked about what is alternative to the canon, so maybe they could understand better the canon without, uh, I don't know if it's right, but this, this was like kind of my approach. And in the process of teaching, I realized that teaching, uh, curating is actually by default what museums do and what cura uh, curators do. Uh, this mediation work and uh, is actually by default pedagogical. And for me, by, uh, what is pedagogical by, is by default activist. So this is where I end with a beautiful quote from Simon Sheik. And yeah. Thank you. So, do you have any questions? Or? There were, uh, the story of Snezhani is not the only story. There are, uh, there are other curators who are working on other, other projects in, in, at Garage at the same time when the war started. Uh, for instance, the project about, uh, of, of uh, Anne Imhoff was transferred to Amsterdam, to Stadelijk. Uh, I saw the name of uh, Helen Martin, one of the you know, very yeah. exceptional artists. And there, the, uh, Maurizio Catalano, obviously. So there was like what... And I happen to be, uh, sorry, I have to brag, because I happen to be part of this exhibition, um, Spirit Labor, 
uh, and uh, Snežana and Dve Miziano invited me to Moscow at the end of January this year, just before the war, for a lecture uh, about Christo and Jean-Claude and their engagement with the, the notion of time, how their projects evolve in, in time. Um, and um, this was, at, on one level, nobody expected that there will really be a war. And then the, the exhibitions that were available in Moscow at the time was like mind boggling You know, Pushkin Museum, Jean Hubert Martin, like completely. They see, uh, the gas, uh, gas, gas, gas station yeah. number two, uh, where it was like the newly opened space in the center of Moscow by another of the mm. uh, famous Russian supporters of art, uh, Leonid, what was his name? Michelson? Mikkelson, mm -hmm. uh, this VAC contemporary, which is one of the funding bodies of the Venice Biennial, the second, in fact, after uh, the Foundation Biennial, uh, Venice Biennial, so in the last 10 years. And all of a sudden, all of this is like because of the decisions of, of, of some, I mean, crazy people, monsters, in fact. I mean, this is all as a cultural development, it's, it's all over. So, I mean, I don't know, how, how, can you, um, okay, let's say I formulate a, a question. Mm. What's happening now to your colleagues from Garage? Uh, they're there, they're still there. Uh, Sasha, I mean, she is, she is Garage. Uh, you, you know, she has uh, the, uh, she was the one that uh, had the, the archives. Uh, you know, then, then uh, Anton kind of said, okay, let's build, uh, you know, around it. So. Uh, Katya, I think, is uh, Katya Nazemtsa is the chief curator. Uh, I'm not sure until when she will be there, but she's still there. Uh, some of uh, who stayed. Uh, there's one of the uh, curator of public programs, Nastya Mitushina. She stayed. That's it. The, the rest are gone. Uh, the, the curators of, uh, of film program. Uh, all of us. We're all gone. Uh, yeah, so, but uh, Garage now is uh, basically being preserved, conserved, like a capsule. <laughs> it's, uh, it's transformed, uh, it's functioning in a way like a Ministry of Culture should, so it gives grants uh, as much as it can. Uh, it supports research programs. Uh, it uh, has a library, uh, still archive, you can access it. It has a studio program. Uh, for artist, artist studios, I mean. So it uh, works a little bit like, a, it has always functioned like a Ministry of Culture, but now even more because the exhibition part is gone. So um, yeah, it even, it's even more distilled into a, uh, into a Ministry of Culture model. Uh, yeah, I don't know what will happen in the future, um, but it will take a long time to rebuild this uh, international, let's say, relations and trust that we have spent so much effort to build. It will take a long time. Yeah, this is one thing I know for sure. And I know that, for example, people from film, uh, especially working with video works, uh, they are very eager to uh, loan their works to, sh to screen uh, in Russia. So they, they are not boycotting it. They are especially for film to just check the rights, but uh, most of the artists and the filmmakers, they give the rights very, very eagerly. They are not boycotting it. So at least, at least you can get some, uh, some uh, enlightenment uh, from there. Uh, it's a bit more difficult about, actually, not more difficult, it's non-existing about objects, you know, more kind of material, but film and video. And I'm uh, still very happy for this, <laughs> even for this. Um, yeah. Future projects? Ha. Ha. The future of Balkans, is, of course. Uh, future program uh, is the, the Balkans. Uh, think about the Balkans. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, I've co-founded um, Bulgarian uh, Triennial. I don't know how to call it yet, but uh, uh, Bulgarian of uh, Triennial of Contemporary Art in the Eastern Balkans, which is a bit, you know, with the Manifesto Western Balkans. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a bit of a, well, let's see what happens in the Eastern Balkans. Uh, it's a it's, uh, uh, Wild West, you know, it's uh, Western Balkans is a bit more defined space, like which countries 
take part of it, and the, even European Union is a bit more clear about it. But if you start researching about Eastern Balkans, it's a uh, <laughs> it's like which countries they overlap with the Western, with that. It's like uh. so, which is it's just very interesting, uh, and um, I've wanted to do this for a long time, so a kind of a bigger scale project with a bigger budget, uh, because some, somehow Eastern uh, Europe in general, but uh, Lower East Side, as uh, Lichazara calls it, is even more, I guess, it's, uh, it's very much related to funding issues. Uh, what, you know, visibility is also related to. Uh, and I see now that I came back, Anyway, I'm not going to comment that. But uh, yeah, so I, I, this is the future. I, 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 for me, for me, uh, and for um, I hope uh, most of us who uh, who live here, uh, because I'm I'm determined to stay here for a while, whatever happens. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, let's. Yeah, I really hope we can uh, provide a little bit more visibility for all of us uh, for what we do. And get in the fucking art review powers next uh, 24, 25, we're all gonna be there. Because <laughs> there's not even one person from Eastern Europe now. And this has to change. Yeah. Hmm. Where you understand activism? Aha, uh -huh. that's a good question. To me, to me, uh, art that I uh, tend to work with is not called activism, is not direct activism, because I think art has to has different mission than activism. Uh, activism has absolutely a place to be, and it's very, very important that it exists. But um, the art that, let's say, um, I kind of focus on is art that uh, is uh, expanding the spectrum between yes and no, between black and white. Uh, is making more complex things, uh, more complicated. Um, so this is this is where I see the activism conflicting with what I you know what I think art should do. Uh, but for curatorial activism, and this is uh, it's been limited to direct kind of. Um, let's say, uh, re revisioning, working with, you know, specific issues like ecology, gender politics, identity, gentrification, all of that. Uh, but I want to expand what activism means in uh, curatorial. Uh, I want to bring it back to body, uh, bodily experience. We have gone too much into theory, but a lot of curating is about the body experience. It's a very bodily thing, you know. Uh, so I want to bring it back. So, for example, I teach with my students, I teach them bodily practice in curating. We do, we reconstruct performances. We like, we do Lydia Clark's uh, sessions uh, with like the objects. Uh, we interact with those objects. Like we, uh, it's very important to change the relationship with the object so that you can change anything else, you know, if you want to uh, work as a curator, I think this is a, so then I also think uh, more uh, invisible, and uh, long-standing practices are also part of activism. You know, they, are, uh, they remain uh, slightly invisible, uh, <laughs> but uh, they are. Like, it takes uh, sometimes more courage to, more, like, you know, effort to do that, uh, despite everything. You know, education is one of them, pedagogy is one of them. But for me, you know, mediation is also uh, part of this practice. And uh, mediation has many forms, but, um, yeah, I want to expand what activism means. Uh, not to blur it, not to like wa water it and say everything can be activism. No, I don't want to do that. And um, if I do that, please tell me. Uh, but uh, it would be interesting to see you working on the notion like of the gray field between actionism and activism. Mm. Recently, they started calling everything contemporary art. Uh, they started doing biennials of contemporary themselves. And so their strategy was to say, mm, anything can be contemporary, even like the painting of little dogs and uh, flowers, this is contemporary art. So like blurring it down is a, uh, was a strategy. They would have created that from Bulgaria. Exactly. What? They would have created that from Bulgaria. 
Who's got the programming? <laughs> <laughs> he is very well established. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but also, um, yeah, in the early nineties, uh, if you wanted to make like uh, uh, the, the terminology related to happenings, performances in the, in Bulgaria was so omnipresent that even the, the politicians started borrowing. Started, uh, everybody was a curator, and they started calling the political rallies. Uh, in support of this or that vote, this or that party, they started calling them the happenings and performances because that was fancy at the time, trendy. But on, uh, and nowadays, it's actually legally, it's much easier to organize, to get permission from the municipality to do a performance in public space rather than a political uh, event, like a demonstration or something mm. like that. It's uh, maybe elsewhere as well. But on the other side, uh, remember there's this uh, theoretician curator, Oriol, uh, Nicolas Oriol. Uh, so he was here about more than 20 years ago, something like 20 years ago. And so, uh, among other things, he, he maintained that every art that is produced nowadays is contemporary, but we have to make the judgment whether it's good art or bad art, is relevant, mm. or so relevant, this direction or that direction. So, I mean, this, that, whoever invented this, Soviet Union, it's, uh, of course, yeah, well, otherwise we won't pay attention to it, but in the context of the Putin regime and the, the war, it becomes horrible. Anyways, thank you.